The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability explicit or implied shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome to the Oh Gladsome Light Podcast. This program contains preaching and teaching from an Orthodox Christian perspective to help you in your walk with Jesus Christ and to be victorious in Him. And welcome to the show. Here we go. It's Monday. It's noon. I'm here at W4CY.com, and it's the Oh Gladsome Light radio show, like I do every Monday at noon. W4CY.com with a live call in number of 561-623-9429. That's 561-623-9429. Also, simultaneously, we're broadcasting at K4HD in Hollywood, California, plus W4VET. Skype. We have a Skype connection, W4CY Radio, your Skype address. And, of course, W4CY.com will get you into the website and into the chat room. And today's subject is called the Thousand Year Rain. And I want to thank Chad, my good buddy engineer, for the subject today. What's that mean? Because, uh, you know, we talked uh, at the close of the show last week, and you talked about we talked about the thousand years. I said, well, maybe that should be another subject, uh, because last week I talked about the rapture versus being caught up and what it all meant. So this is like another stepping stone uh, of, of uh, understanding Scripture and not leaning on your own, own interpretation, okay, because uh, you know you can make, try you can make scripture uh, fit any way you want, but we need to balance the scriptures and look at the interpretation of scripture through the eyes of the Holy Spirit and of the church fathers. We have because you know people boast that well I've got the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you know? Are you really filled with the Holy Spirit, or are you just a wannabe? Okay, I hope you're not a wannabe. But I'm talking about stuff here that's. Uh, thousands of years old you know the christianity started around 33 a.d and it's been going on since right now and it'll continue to go on until the lord returns and then it'll still go go on because it's going to be an everlasting <clears throat> we're going to be everlasting so thousand year reign uh there's a perversion or a heresy on the thousand year reign and i'm going to talk about it today and chad if you have anything you want to pipe in on this I, I appreciate your comments at any time yes sir because you know when i told you when i came to the orthodox church the ancient faith my theology was uh shaken i thought i i knew stuff and i i learned stuff wrong and so as my journey uh through the orthodox church and its theology uh, i've let's say i've received more education and so one way of that is it keeps you humble and when you find out something that uh doesn't fit your theology and if then it requires humility on your part to say okay maybe i was wrong or maybe i'm right okay but how do you prove if you're right or you're wrong? And I always go back through uh, the church fathers and the history of, of, of the Orthodox Church, which was one at one time with Rome. We are all one big happy family until the Great Schism of 1054. And that's when uh, that was a real sad day in Christianity when, you know, when the Western Church broke away from the Eastern Church. And so that spirit of schism that that even the Lord talked about, you know, in John chapter 6, Paul talked about it in Corinthians, and even that schism spirit happened in the Garden of Eden, you know. And so, as the Lord says to us, if you have ears to hear or eyes to see, this message today on the thousand-year reign now, <clears throat> let me set some background on this. Is the 70 weeks of Daniel 70 actual weeks, or is it a period of time? What do you guys think about that? 
I think the 70 weeks is supposed to be actually 70 years. Or is it or is it on a period of time that we we can't define? Supposedly it's a period of time that stopped at 69. We're waiting for the final seven. Yeah. So the 70 weeks, what about the seven days of creation? Is that actually done in seven days or was it not? Or is it just a period of time, an interval of time? You, well, a thousand you, years to us is a well, date. I mean, or a date, what is it? A thousand I know years that. to us is a date again? So should we spend all of our time fussing about well, is it 70 weeks or 70 years or is 7,000 weeks or is it seven days or 7,000? I mean, what's yeah, that? You're right about that, Al. We spent too much time, time, time trying to date, set, and figure yes. out all the stuff. What we should have is a right heart that's good with God. Exactly. You know? And times. that's where this message is going today. So apparently you've looked at my notes before the show. Always. I do that. <laughs> I got to prep, too. Well, it's called, the, the, I guess we have a similar spirit, Chad, you know, the same spirit. We're brothers in Christ. There you go. So in it. And the unifier between us is the Holy Spirit, of course. Amen. So there is a doctrine out there called Kiliism. And you say, Kili what? Kiliism. Now, it's a teaching that Christ will reign for a literal thousand years on earth after his second coming. Kiliism was condemned at the Council of Nicaea with the phrase, whose kingdom shall have no end. Now, that was added to the Nicene Creed in the Second Council. See, the... The first council is when the uh, the Nicene Creed was written, but it wasn't really finished until the second council when they added the line, whose kingdom shall have no end. And that second council was held in 381 A.D. Now, I have a, a, a book at my house called The Rudder, and that has all the dogmas and canons of the church, of the Orthodox Church. And... The, also, there are documented all the councils, the seven ecumenical councils are documented in the rudder. And I took a, a footnote, of the number one footnote from page 203. If you have the rudder, any Orthodox Christians out there, they have the rudder. If you go to page 203 and look at footnote number one, I'm going to read a little bit about it. On this account, if refutation of this heresy... That's a pretty strong word, heresy. This council added to the creed of the Nicene Council the statement which it borrowed from a sentence which the archangel Gabriel spoke to the virgin, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's from Luke chapter 1, verse 33. As for the thousand years referred to by St. John, they are not to come to pass after the second advent of Christ. So pay attention now. And the kingdom of the Lord is not describable in terms of years, nor food and drink, as St. Paul said in Romans chapter 14, verses 17. But on the contrary, a thousand years are to be understood according to those versed in theology to mean an interval of time. Extending from the first advent, now what was the first advent of Christ? His birth in Bethlehem, that was the first advent. To the second, during which Satan was bound according to the words of the Lord, saying, Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the ruler of the world be cast out. He's talking about Satan. The first resurrection, by contrast, took place for justification of souls through mortification of infidelity and wickedness concerning which Christ said, he that heareth my words and believeth in them who sent me hath everlasting life and cometh not into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. That's John 5, 24. Now you think about that for a moment. When you come out of death into life, in the Orthodox Church, that process happens at baptism because we usually call the, the candidates who are baptized the newly illuminated because once they come out of the bap the triple immersion in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit they come out of the waters of baptism okay then something happens they go into another sacrament of the church called chrismation where they are anointed with holy miron and all of, all of the part their, their head their cheeks their mouth their their heart, their hands, their feet are all anointed with this oil because now they are sealed in the Holy Spirit. And so basically church membership in the Orthodox Church begins with baptism, chrismation, that's the holy chrism, and 
receiving of the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ called the Holy Eucharist. That's what happens in an Orthodox Church when somebody is newly illumined. So we spend a lot of time. You know, we get this thing about, uh, I was thinking about this message uh, and uh, how the uh, how the Lord, was he victorious at the cross? Did Was the Lord victorious at Calvary? Yes, sir. Okay. At Calvary, what happened? First of all, the sin problem was taken care of, wasn't it? But he shed his own blood for the remission of sins. That's what he did. Calvary, uh, it was finalized. Exactly. Didn't he say it is finished mm -hmm. when he was when he was expiring on the cross? As he give a, he gave his spirit back up to God the Father. And he even says in his in his flesh in his spirit there on the cross, he says, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." I mean, would we be able to do that, Chad? If first, we're... first he died for everyone, and then he forgave at the last moment everyone that you know mocked him, spit on him, crucified yeah. him. Amazing man. I mean, well, only God, God can do that. Only God can do that. A man can't do that right. because all we want to do is, well, right. we want to we want to go out and whoop whip some butt. <laughs> me, 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 me. Self, self, self. Yeah, we we want to we want to uh, you know make ourselves uh, bigger than what we're supposed to be. So we think about. See, we get caught up in when 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 the Lord came here in His first advent through baptism. His whole ministry was a ministry of death and you say well how is that because even in the in the manger the clothes that he was wrapped in were actually burial clothes isn't that amazing that they the swaddling clothes were burial clothes and then those clothes are you know i'm not saying that those clothes were used at his burial but a similar type of clothing was used when they wrapped his body and put it in the tomb and then women were coming back uh, Sunday morning to finish the burial process because it was a Sabbath day. And they find an angel sitting there at the tomb saying, uh, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen. And then they went in and told the apostles, and they were all hiding, knees knocking, and biting their nails and all that stuff because of fear of the Jews. And then they get some boldness, and they run to the tomb and find it empty except they find the burial clothes. And then the Lord shows up for 40 days in resurrection power for 40 days and shows himself to whoever he wants to. The two guys that are walking on the road to Emmaus, he showed himself. He raised the saints that, that rolled out of the tombs, you know, on his that earthquake, that great earthquake. So now, then the Lord ascended, didn't he? He ascended from Mount Olives. He ascended back into heaven after 40 days and even the angels said they're having here are the apostles looking up and getting a crick in their neck probably looking up and saying and then the angel says what are you what are you guys looking at he says in the same way he ascended he will come again in the same place probably right in the same place the mount of olives and he's gonna split why do you the think the jews have all their tombs right there at uh at, uh, on mount of olives well, most of them d didn't really believe in christ so why are they on the mount of olives because they they know from their old testament scriptures that the messiah will come there oh really isn't okay. that amazing the connection between it the lord already did all this he is the messiah of all the jews and the gentiles and uh, just because you reject Jesus as your Messiah, uh, does it make him not the Messiah? Well, they're waiting on him. He's going to come and split that mountain. <laughs> who is who is uh, who's more powerful, you or the Lord? I mean, I I, I don't want to contend with the Lord because I know I'm going to lose. That last couple hurricanes should have answered your question. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, the great wind <laughs> that was upon us. So we get caught up in this. Uh, thousand year reign and all that stuff and all sounds all good and you know and and uh, wonderful but let me say did not jesus say my kingdom is not of this world he's standing there talking to pilot okay this before his crucifixion and and uh you know that uh the lord could have escaped the cross but it was his it was his mission to come here as the God-man and die for us, 
to remit our sins, okay, to take care of that sin problem that is the that is the wall that is between us and the Father. Jesus has breached that wall with his own blood, so now we have access to the Father through his, his flesh. So then Pilate says, "For the, so you say you are a king. And then Jesus, not a, hey, this is why I was put on this earth, is to, to do everything I did and to obey everything the Father said to do, I did, and then to go to the cross, a free, a freely go to the cross and die a cruel death. If you can even imagine putting yourself there in that situation of how horrific that was that day when Jesus was on the cross. Uh, a form of crucifixion is beyond description as far as what it does to the human body. So he is a king, but not of this world. Okay? I am, I'm, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. So we get caught up in all this stuff. So I ask myself this question, you know, getting this message ready to go uh, today. It says, okay, the Lord... Uh, came here, lived among sinful man, was treated horribly and spit upon and, and crucified, but then the resurrection came. And so I asked myself, and then ascend back into heaven, I think heaven's a lot better place than this earth to be. If you think about, if you can even go there with your mind to think about how, how beautiful and how peaceful heaven is, and then why would he want to come back here and, and walk around and get Dusty's feet and, 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 and walk in sandals again on this earth? Why would he want to do that? Well, that's why I'm going to talk about this thousand-year reign today. Remember, we're supposed to be spiritual people here, not fleshly people, because it says in the Scripture that the spirit and the flesh war against each other. That's that process where you've got you to be able to uh, say no to the flesh and say yes to the Spirit of God. I mean, who do you, who do you want to be uh, victor, victorious in your life, Satan or Christ? You can, have either, you can have it either way, but you can't have it both ways. Either you're going to have Christ or you're going to have Satan. Your choice. See, God has already set that up in the Old Testament. He's given, given us that. He's given us the, uh, he's laid those choices before us. You choose, he says, you choose. Now, this belief here of Killianism amongst many Protestants today arises from a misinterpretation of the scriptures and our saints and holy elders hold for us the key to properly understand Scripture and the end times as far as it is given to us to know. The very widespread at the present time is the teaching about the thousand-year kingdom of Christ on the earth before the universal or last judgment. This teaching is known by the name of Kilianism, from the Greek word kiliosmos, meaning a thousand years. The essence of this teaching is as follows. Now, I'm going to tell you what this what, what Kellyanism is, okay, and why it's a heresy. Long before the end of the world, Christ will come again to the earth to overcome the Antichrist and resurrect only the righteous to establish a new kingdom on earth in which the righteous, as a reward for their struggles and sufferings, will reign together with him for the course of 1,000 years, taking enjoyment of all the good things of a temporal life. After this, they will follow a second universal resurrection of the dead, the universal judgment, and the universal and eternal giving of rewards. Now, let's talk about that for a minute here. In the Orthodox Church, the theology is, and is transmitted to us by the church, church fathers, okay? The first advent of Christ is when it began. The thousand years, which is a period of time, not an exact thousand years, but it's a period, of, an interval of time, and that will, and so we're in it right now. We're in the thousand year, as you say, the thousand year reign in Revelation 20 now, and why, why we are in this is because, first of all, when Jesus came as a baby and died on the cross and resurrected, okay, he established something brand new. He gave us something brand new. Now, what is it? Be is it better to be in the flesh? 
or in the Spirit. The flesh is fading away. The flesh is going to end up in the ground. But what about the Spirit is eternal. So hang with me on this as I go. Go on if I, as I get deeper into this study of the thousand-year reign. Such are the ideas of the Achilles, okay, which I just read. The defenders of this teaching found themselves on the visions of the seer of the mysteries, that'd be John the Revelator, in the 20th chapter of the Apocalypse, which is the, the, the Greek word that means revelation. There is said that an angel descended from heaven and bound Satan for a thousand years, and that the souls of those beheaded for the witness of, of Jesus and for the word of God came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. That'd be chapter 20, verse 5. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. Soon uh, there follows the judgment of the devil and of those who are deceiving by him. The dead will be raised up and the judged according to their deeds. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death as recorded in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. Upon those who have been resurrected in the first resurrection, however, however, the second death will have no power. So let's talk about that first. How do you become born again? <laughs> See, or did not Jesus talk about that? You know, he talked about being born, unless you're born again of, of, of water and the Spirit, you got to be born again. John, I think it's John chapter 3, you got to be born again. And a lot of people say, well, how can I go back into my mother's womb? He's not talking about that. He's talking about a spiritual birth. And that would be the first resurrection that we're talking about. Kiliastic views were spread in antiquity, chiefly among the heretics. However, they are also to be encountered in certain ancient Christian writers of the universal church. For example, Papias of Heropolis, Justin the Martyr, and Irenaeus of Lyons. In more recent times, these views were resurrected in the Protestant sects. And finally, we see attempts in certain modernistic theologians of our times to introduce Kiliastic ideas also in the orthodox theolo theological thought, and that is dangerous, very dangerous. As it has been indicated in this teaching, there are supposed to be two future judgments, one for the resurrected righteous ones and then a second universal one. There are two future resurrections, first one of the righteous and then other of the sinners. And there are two future comings of the Savior in glory. There is a future purely earthly, even though blessed, reign of Christ with the righteous as one's as definite historical epoch. Formerly, this teaching is based on an incorrect understanding of the expression, the first resurrection. While inwardly, it causes, it, while inwardly, its cause is rooted in the loss among the masses of the contemporary sectarianism of faith in life after death in the blessedness of the righteous in heaven with whom they have no communion in prayer. And another cause in certain sects is to be found in utopian dreams for society hidden behind religious ideas and inserted into myst mysterious Mysterious images of the apocalypse. And I'll tell you what you know. I think it's everybody's uh, anybody with that that is uh, normal. Okay, uh, would want peace. You know, I don't walk. I don't wake up in the morning wanting to have a battle right off the bat with my fellow man. I, don't we want to seek peace and understanding in our life with each other? Now it's usually the politicians and the governments of all these nations of course the, the same one that satan offered jesus you know right. two thousand some years ago right when he was on after his fat great fast a 40-day fast the satan comes to him in the wilderness and says he start, shows you all these things and, and you know jesus has it man not, shall not live by bread alone and on it goes mm -hmm. and you should and, he, and finally he says you shall worship, worship the lord your god only and and that he he and then what does satan do he flees he flees from them. Now, Satan was running around and causing all kinds of trouble, but then after the cross, that's when he was defeated. Now, he has limited power. And I'll tell you what, we give him too much credit for what we do. Well, Satan made me do it. Really? Or did your evil flesh do it? 
don't don't always blame Satan for you know you have a choice if you're illuminated and you are, uh, have a new life in Christ you are, you are, there's a choice laid before you to sin or not to sin that's your choice God says I I would hope you walk away from it you have the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling you to walk away from sin but in our flesh we can say oh let's feed the flesh a little bit and let's get into sin okay any Christian <coughs> That is spirit filled, and falls into the, into a sin trap. After that is accomplished, what do they feel like? Garbage. You feel like you're lower than the than the lowest can be. You just feel like there's no way I can be forgiven of this one. That's guilt. Yeah, and then guess what? Guess what the Satan wants you to do? He wants you to say, "Well, this sin is too much for God to forgive, so I'm just going to forget it, forget it all." And is that wrong thinking? Yes, because did not Jesus die for all of it, past, present, and future? He died for all of it. So when Satan comes to you and breathes that word, or his little demon buddies breathe on you about that, you, you just got to, you know, there's there's an old saying in, in the in Mount Athos that uh, what do we do, what do the monks do up there? We fall, we get up. We fall, we get up. So the point is, you must always get up. You fall. And, and you and you feel bad you go to, you confess your sins and then move on and with what God's help you can be victorious it is not difficult to see the error of the Kiliistic interpretation of the 20th chapter of the Apocalypse parallel passages in sacred scripture clearly indicate that the first resurrection signifies spiritual birth now you can't take like i said before you can't take one verse of scripture and then build a whole theology on it judas hung himself so what are we supposed to do after the radio show i guess i'm supposed to go out there on the balcony and hang myself i don't think so but you being a, a being a Christian and reading, are we not supposed to read the Word of God, hide it in our heart, but read it all? Read it all. Don't just take one verse, but you have to balance all of this through the all of Holy Scripture. You just can't take one verse, like a thousand years, and then build a theology on it, like the Achilles did. In parallel passages in sacred scripture clearly indicate that the first resurrection signifies a spiritual rebirth into eternal life. Did that happen when you were born again? That's when your eternal life began, not when you go to heaven. Your eternal life is now on this earth. Your eternal life in Christ through baptism and resurrection through faith in Christ according to the words... Awake thou that sleepeth and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. Ephesians chapter 5, 14. You are risen with Christ. We read many times in the, in the apostles' epistles. Colossians 3, 1 and 2, 12. And Ephesians 2, 5 through 6. Proceeding from this by the thousand-year reign, one must understand that the period of time from the very beginning of the kingdom of grace of the church of Christ and in particular of the triumph church in of heaven until the end of the world the church which is militant upon the earth in essence also is triumphant in the victory performed by the savior so by not doing that you are turning your back upon that sacrifice at calvary you're saying that what the lord did is not sufficient he did it all that's why he said in the beginning of the show chad we said it is finished he did it all he is the Lord, I think he's a pretty good bookkeeper. I think he knows what he's doing when it comes to the salvation of our souls. I think he's the master of our salvation. And now, is the prince of, of this world, he's still roaming around? Well, he has limited power. Most of it was taken away at the cross. He was defeated at the cross of Calvary. And that's why it's so important for us to come acknowledge that sacrifice. Even John 17, the Lord says, he, his, he, when he's talking to the Father, his prayer to the intercession, great intercessory prayer to the Father, he says, he says that, that they would believe that you, Father, have sent me. That was an issue. That people would believe that Jesus came from the Father. 
Now the second death is a judgment of sinners at the last judgment. It will not touch those who have parted in the first resurrection. Those of us who have been born again in the spirit, we're immune to that. This means that those who are spiritually reborn in Christ are and purified by the grace of God in the church will not be subjected to judgment. Aren't we to judge ourselves all the time? Aren't we to judge lest you be judged? Our job is maintenance. What Christ has done it all. He has given us the Holy Spirit, and now it's maintenance of maintaining your walk with Christ. If it was at one time possible to express Kiliastic ideas as private opinions, this was, the, was only until the ecumenical church, the council, the second council, expressed its judgment about this. But when the second ecumenical council, 381 AD, in condemning all the errors of the heretic Apollinarius, that's the guy's name, Apollinarius, condemned also his teaching of the thousand-year reign of Christ and introduced into the very symbol of faith, the words concerning Christ and his kingdom shall have no end. It became no longer permissible at all for any Orthodox Christian to hold these opinions of the Kilistic idea, the Kilistic heresy. One of the leading church fathers of the early church who combated the heresy of Kiliism was the blessed Augustine. He connects the binding of the devil for a thousand years with the binding of the strong man in Mark chapter 3. The words of Christ just before his passion, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. I don't think a man that's going to the cross is going to waste his words. I think he's going to let them know what's happening. There's no, did Jesus die in secret? He was on a hill. Golgotha in public view. He was dragged to he made to made to walk the streets with his cross. Yes, and, right. And they kind of shame you, I guess. Uh, it's to, the crucifixion is totally a shame. You know, the crucifixion. A little history on that where that came from. It came from the the uh, the uh, uh, Phoenicians, that civilization before Rome, and they thought that anybody who uh, deserved death, they put them all up on a tree. And it suspended them between earth and heaven so they wouldn't pollute Mother Earth. Have you heard of Mother Earth today? It's amazing. It's back, isn't it? It's kind of like Romans. the same people that praise the universe yeah, or put it out there in the universe. And so the Romans perfected the art of crucifixion. And that was a Roman way of dying. The Jews, when they killed somebody, they did it by what? Stoning them. Stone them. And that's when Pilate says, well, to deal with it. And then they... They flipped it on him. You know, we're going to let we're going to rat you out to Caesar if you don't take care of this pilot. So that's when he washed his hands of this whole affair and he gave him all the uh, soldiers and equipment to go ahead and crucify him in a Roman manner. So that you know when he when he hears stuff like this, the binding of the devil is he can't exercise his whole power to seduce men as it was going on before the cross. Orthodox Christians who have experienced the life of grace in the church can well understand what Protestants cannot, that the thousand years, the whole period of Christ's reign and with his saints and the limited power of the devil is now. So we don't want to keep looking. Gee, I can hardly wait for the thousand years. Friends and neighbors, you're living in it now. <laughs> If you don't agree with me, then do some study. Because I've done my study, and I tell you what, I had many, I had many times, many opportunities to say, well, I don't agree with this. I, I'm, I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to leave the Orthodox Church. Where are you going to go? It's like when the Jesus says, when, when the, a lot of his apostles, his disciples, defected from him in John chapter 6. They left him because he was talking about Holy Communion. He was talking about his body and blood. And he looked to Peter and the apostles and said, you guys still here? After he got down with that discourse. And what did Peter say? Lord, where shall we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Peter knew. 
You know, I, I last week I talked about the rapture being uh, that that. And if you want to know more about it, you got to go listen to that radio show. It's on iHeart. Okay, go to my website, ogladsomelight.org, and scroll down to iHeartRadio, and there's a, there'll be an episode list, and it's called The Great Escape. And you'll get the truth of the rapture versus being caught up and how important that is. This thing was invented by a guy named Darby in the 1830s. So I'm not going to spend any time with this rapture thing because I've already covered it. I already covered it in the last in the last radio show. It's amazing, Chad. That uh, I wonder what I'm going to talk about, and next thing I know, I'm I'm in it. <laughs> and I thank you for helping me because you're giving me these little seeds. And uh, who knows what's going to be going on next week? Go. I have no idea. The the blackboard is blank right now as far as what's going to be going on next week. Yeah. It is important to understand that the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation does not introduce any new teaching about the end of the world and the second coming of Christ. Its purpose is to, here it comes, to summarize the battle between the devil and the church, which permeates the whole history of mankind. The devil is defeated twice, first spiritually by the redemptive death of the Savior. Now, that's why the cross is so important. You cannot, you cannot minimize that sacrifice at Calvary. And at the end of the world, completely and finally, when he will be thrown into the lake of fire, Christian martyrs begin to celebrate their victory over Satan immediately following their death for Christ. Do you think about that? When somebody dies as a martyr for Christ, what happens? There is an altar in heaven. Guess where they're at? They're under that altar, and they're crying out to Christ daily, when will you avenge our blood? You don't die. When you die, you don't die. You're not like a dog and lay down and die and turn back into dust. Your body does, but then there's a promise that you're going to get a resurrection body. But right now, the, the spirit goes and, and is with Christ. Now, give it, I'm, I'm trying to give you some more uh, picture of what's going on here. The kingdom of Christ derived not from this world constitutes a church or the body of Christ, of which the head is Christ himself. Is not Christ the head of the church? The adoption and entrance into this kingdom takes only place through the laver of regeneration or baptism. No one can enter into this reign of, the, of God except through baptism, which is to say by being born again from above or being born of water and the Spirit, as I said earlier. According to the word of the Savior, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. As soon as you are baptized, you are in the kingdom of God. Yeah, you're still on this earth walking around, but in the Spirit, you're with Christ. Or you're going to deny his power. Right there, if you say, well, I don't believe that. Well, then you just denied the power of God in your life. Live with that one. So baptism is I actually referred to as as a res as a type of resurrection. That's why it's the first resurrection. This also it is that the Orthodox Christians baptism is a renaissance of life and a resurrection from the dead. Because doesn't he say you were we're all dead spiritually dead dead until we come to the baptismal waters and are illumined and take on take on Christ. When the apostle writes, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light, he has in mind precisely this internal regeneration and resurrection through Christian baptism, for no one can enter the kingdom of Christ unless he has first been brought out from among the dead by Christian baptism. I hope you all hanging in there and haven't hung up on me, because, uh, you know, i got more to talk about here. When I get done tonight, today, I hope I have time to get to the uh, to the new heaven and the new earth because that's something, uh, this is tied right into this. This whole thing uh, of this this uh, this interval of time we're in and how, how it plays into the new heaven and the new earth. I hope I have time to address it. In Holy Scripture, the someone, uh, sin, someone's sinful condition is also compared to a kind of death. It is with this being that the Savior says to one of the disciples who has asked leave to go first and bury his father, he says, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. 
Likewise, does he speak with his mind when he say, He that believeth in me, though he were dead, he shall live, and whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now, is the Lord lying, or is he telling the truth? Or are, are we so spiritually dead or dumb that we can't believe or understand what he's trying to tell us here in the scriptures? And that came out of John chapter 11. The apostle also had this meaning in mind when he wrote, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Isn't that we're supposed to be dead unto sin? But boy, don't we give it life. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can be alive unto God is through Jesus Christ. Although the duration of the reign of Christ is designated on the whole as a thousand years, we should understand that this is to signify an era immeasurable and undesignated. Therefore, its length is nothing else except the period between the first and the second coming of the Lord, or more precisely, the period of the consolidation of the kingdom of God until a second coming. This is the explanation of the kingdom of God and its duration upon the earth. It's easy to, to say, I don't believe that. What about the seven seals? Who has the authority to break the seven seals? Only Jesus Christ. That's it. Only the Lord. So do we, do we totally understand the seven seals? No. What about the red horse that is like unto fire? We don't know about these, the, the red horse. We may, we may sp spin our theology on that and say, well, we think it's this, but why not? Why don't you do some research? Find out what the church fathers are saying about all this stuff. These guys that live ascetic lives, fasted and prayed, and gave up uh, worldly pleasures and worldly lusts to seek a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Christ. Some of them went into caves, dwelt on mountains, and totally uh, junked humanity because their relationship with God was so important that, that they, they knew that he was able to save their souls and not mankind. Don't think that man can save you. He cannot. You will be totally disappointed. I have so much here, but I'm going to run out of time. Let's see if I can get to it right now. You remember the sheep goat judgment, you know, and the wheat and the tares? And we talked about the, the ten virgins, five with, five without, you know, the, the sufficient oil. You know, concerning the passages of the Old Testament, these cannot be understood as if they were magical, but, e but are either factual or symbolic like the book from which they are derived. How can someone know that the six days of creation were in actuality? Some even some say 7,000 years, and they each represent a great duration of time for humanity, or even 1,000 years. So let's not worry about that. I, many times in this radio show, I say don't worry about the date, setting, and trying to put time to uh, work on your salvation with fear and trembling. Get yourself ready to meet the Lord, as the five wise virgins did. And I, and I thank God that, that the, the, uh, the Second Ecum Ecumenical Council put an end to this uh, killism by, and, and, and the heresy of Apollinarius by putting in that passage in the, in the you know, the kingdom without end. Not take, not, they didn't think this up on their own. They just used the words of Archangel Mike Gabriel as he came and talked to the Blessed Mother, Mary, before she was pregnant with the Lord. So let the Kilius know that they cannot make human calculations and determinations for the mysteries that are unknown to the angels and even in his humanity to the Son of God himself. Remember Jesus said, only the Father knows. So what do we do? who do we think we are? We're more intelligent than the Father? Well, I talk a few minutes about the new heaven and the new earth. The essence of divinity is light. As St. John has said, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Have you ever seen that, Chad, that, that yin and the yang? Yep. You see that the black with a white dot and the white with a black dot? Mm -hmm. That's heresy. But you, that's heresy. You think about that. In God, there's no darkness. And then here's that white with that little black dot, and that's darkness. Is that kind of like the Satan people use the as above, so below? Mm-hmm. 
Is it duality? Is that what they call it? I guess. Hmm. Yeah. Christ's return at the end of the Great Tribulation will bathe the, the earth in divine light as the evening stars fade from view, and so shall all material sources of light pale beneath the brilliance of Christ's divine illumination. It happened at Mount Tabor when Christ changed there. He had his metamorphosis. You know, when he transfigured there for a moment, and he, he started to shine really bright. That's, that was like a foretaste, and the three three apostles with him saw that. Just like Moses did back on right. Sinai. He the veil. He had to wear a veil. Right? He glowed. He better wear a veil because he wouldn't freak out the rest of the Israelites. So I guess when you come in contact with heaven, you're going to glow for a bit. <laughs> I mean, even St. Seraphim Seraph, he had such a relationship with God. When he was being interviewed by this guy, uh, Motovilov, he couldn't look him in the eye because his eyes were such a brilliant flash. I want that. Right. I want my eyes to do that. I want people that can't look me in the eye because there's so much God coming through that it blinds them. The light, not the darkness. Right, the light. There shall be no night there. There will be no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. Revelation 22, 5. Now that's neat. That is. That's that's divine power, yeah. and we haven't seen that yet. We all we got is we got faith. We got to have faith and believe what the cross did. God is so we can be in the first resurrection, where death has no power over the over the those the first resurrection. Even the mighty sun will seem dark by comparison. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. St. Matthew uh, chapter 24. <coughs> Referring to this, St. John Chrysostom taught us that the sun and the stars are not destroyed, but overcome by the light of his presence. And the stars shall not fall, for what, for what shall they be the need of them for being you know, when God is here in residence with all the light and the divine power, he's, it's like, you know, <laughs> I've told this story to my wife. She likes this. You know, I go to the store and I buy her flowers for her birthday, right? In the store that looks so be radiant and beautiful. And I take them home and I put them next to my wife. I says, do you know they look more prettier in the store? She goes, what do you mean? She says, when it got next to your countenance and your beauty, they just aren't as, as beautiful as you are, you know? So sweet. Yeah. But that's what I'm trying to put, parallel this with the Lord. I'm not saying she's the Lord, but I'm saying that's a comparison that when the Lord shows up in his divine power and light, everything else is going to dim. In this new heaven and earth, Satan will never enter in. Thank God. Death will not be known there. It will be destroyed. But only eternal life and God's righteousness we look for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Second Peter chapter three verse thirteen. Now I talked about the Lord's transfiguration real quick. On Mount Tabor was a preview of the glory of his coming. The gospel records that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Isn't that amazing? That's what the apostles saw. And the Lord tells them, Don't tell nobody. Shh, don't tell nobody. Not until after I'm resurrected. The light of Christ will illumine those who are prepared for it and burn those who are not. And that's why I put that picture up on my Facebook page of that fire that comes, that river of fire that comes from the throne of God and it comes into hell. It's the same fire, but if you love God, you'll feel the love of God. If you hate God, you'll, you'll feel the hate. It's up to you. It always boils back to us. It's our choice. Even a St. Simeon's prayer before Holy Communion and indicates this. O thou who givest me willingly thy flesh for food, thou art the fire that burnest the unworthy, scorch me not, O my maker, but rather pass through me for the integration of my members into all my joints, my affections, my, and my heart, and burn up the thorns of all my sins. And that's a prayer we, we would say in our heart before we enter in into Holy Communion. So I hope what I've talked about today makes some sense to you because uh, this is what the church fathers have taught. This is the actual proper interpretation of the thousand-year reign. Friends and neighbors, you are in it now, whether you like it or not. I hope you like it because it's, if you're baptized, you're in the, you've 
share in the first resurrection and the second and and then you know that you won't there's no need for another resurrection you got the first resurrection now the resurrection in the spirit now there's going to be that second resurrection and that'll be the body and that's what's coming and that's a future event but right now enjoy your your reign in the thousand years of christ that he established at the cross of calvary in the name of the father son and the holy spirit amen Thank you for listening to the O Gladsome Light Podcast. We hope this program has encouraged you to fight the good fight of faith and walk in the accordance with the commandments of our Lord. May God bless you on your journey to salvation.